I'm Jared Carpenter. This is More Than Blockchain. And on this episode, I get to tap back in with Thomas Farah, who was on episode 80, which was actually put out on looking at the calendar here, June 20th of 2023. So it's almost a year to the date by the time this will be published, which is kind of crazy and serendipitous. But anyways, Thomas, how are you? Thanks for hopping on. I'm good to be here, Jared. Thanks for inviting me back on. Absolutely. I said this on the first episode, which once again, I will leave that link in the description if you want to check it out. Uh, Thomas is a founder or co-founder, I should say, of Hey Apollo. And we really highlighted that company on the first episode. But one of the things I said on this episode, on that episode, I don't know if you remember, I praised you for your meme skills. Do you remember this? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah. I praised you for your meme skills. And since they've only gotten better, I was reviewing your X feed earlier and it's just unbelievably fire. Uh, I, I don't know where to start. I just kind of want to talk Bitcoin with you. You know, on more than blockchain, I talk to all types of people that are in Web3. It's not a Bitcoin only podcast, even though. I have flirted with just calling it more than Bitcoin, um, but I wanted to have you on to just talk about all things Bitcoin. So if you could, could you just kind of give us a one over, you know, a, a, a two minute kind of where we are in Bitcoin. The ETFs have come out four or five months ago, I guess January 10th, so about five months ago. Where are we uh, and how are things looking? Is this going to be a, a Bitcoin summer? Sure. Um... Well, I mean, it's it's always it's it's a good place to start. Um, well, I mean, look at it. Obviously, we're sitting right now about sixty nine, sixty nine thousand. Um, just basically at the crest of the all time high. Uh, kind of had a like a really hot start to the year after these ETFs launched, um, and then and then kind of. No, we've been trading sideways, I guess, for a few months, um, consol consolidating right at that kind of all-time high level. Just, I guess, only, we're only sort of six weeks, really, at this point or so after the, the latest halving. Um, and, it, and it does look like we're kind of building a base, building a... Uh, building a base at this kind of new level where we've got all this... Um, Kind of a new paradigm essentially that's that's come about because of these ETFs. It's a different class of investors coming into Bitcoin. Uh, you can see that these are, and and I'm I'm really I'm talking about in, in two ways. First of all, you have the actual ETF providers, you know, BlackRock, Fidelity, and their client base, and the kind of um, bias that they are in the sense of they're looking to buy and hold really fundamentally. It's just a long term, long term investors. Um, we obviously we do have kind of some speculation as, as, as you always do. And there are hedge funds buying and we, we kind of monitor like the, the sort of cool thing about these uh, ETFs is that you get these 13 F reports which show actually who is who is buying and you kind of get little nuggets along the way so you do get to see these things like oh the Wisconsin pension fund they they've dipped their toes in and they're buying bitcoin but you also see oh you've got these hedge funds and you've got these these uh up, like endowments and you've got Morgan Stanley buying 250 million dollars of bitcoin and you get a real idea that it's a new um like the you know, for years we talked about the institutions coming to Bitcoin. And it's like, it's not, it's not a, it's it, that, with the way we used to talk about it then is probably the way we talk about nation states buying Bitcoin today. It's like, it's gonna, it's gonna come, but it hasn't, like, like, and we're all like, we know, like, we know it's, it's coming. The, the, the central bank's gonna buy Bitcoin, the nation state's gonna buy Bitcoin. It hasn't happened yet, really. It hasn't, it hasn't happened yet. Well, that's the, where we are today is where we were a few years ago in the sense of the banks are going to buy Bitcoin, the pension funds are going to buy Bitcoin, the endowment's going to find Bitcoin. Well, now it's actually happening. That's, that's where we are. But, you know, it's still very early on in that journey in the sense that these ETFs have only been live for... Um, a handful of months and you don't see flows come in like 
you, you, we're just in the early stages of the flows in the sense that, first of all, we need time to set it up and get these kind of advisors onboarded into the system. We, there, there's a whole lot of infrastructure that still needs to be built out to actually enable investment into, into these ETF providers. There's a simple reason because most people are investing via this, a, a whole range of different platforms. And if your financial advisor, say Goldman Sachs, they need to offer the ETF platform in order to, they need to offer the ETF as your broker in order to be able to invest in it. And it doesn't just all happen on day one. So what's happening is there's constantly new partnerships being built, new arrangements. Oh, X provider is now offering Fidelity on their platform. And they're, they're sort of being constantly unlocked. And you're, you're watching the dominoes fall and you're watching the availability and accessibility of Bitcoin ETFs being available into this broader traditional finance market. And that's really the story of 2024. It's this kind of uh, Bitcoin being embedded into the traditional financial world is, is, is what it is. Um, this broader Bitcoin adoption, Bitcoin embedding itself into Wall Street, embedding itself into traditional financial portfolios. Um, and, you know, here we are, like everybody, I guess that sort of, involved in Bitcoin is just watching this. I mean, that's what we're focused on, watching these flows, these waves of adoption, these waves of Bitcoin buying happening into these ETF flows. Um, and we're, and we're watching, it, watching it play out, watching it happen. It's, it's all very exciting. Um, so yeah, as I said, we're sitting currently now. We've got, we're looking right now at, we just had about $2 billion of buying in the last three days into these ETFs. And it looks like we're on the kind of crest formation of another wave into these ETFs. So we had the first wave in February, March. That was the real big wave of uh, initial excitement coming into these ETFs. Had a bit of a pause consolidation in uh, April and May. And now we're, we're really seeing it come back big time. Um, so I think, yeah, I think that's probably a pretty good summation of where we are at the moment. Yeah, I think that was absolutely excellent. And selfishly, I'm really excited to clip that because that was perfect. You just kind of broke it down in a couple minutes. And can you actually, in February and March, I believe, hey, Apollo, you guys put out a tracker for the ETFs. Is that right? And maybe that's now transformed into flows, which we can talk about as well. Sure. But do you guys still have that tracker up? And how's that going? Yeah, yeah, no, we um, we're tracking we're tracking all the Bitcoin flows, Bitcoin ETF uh, flows. It's, it's on our it's on our website. Um, yeah, so we we look at we have all, all all kind of the data about how much how much how much Bitcoin all of these ETFs have. We also have the Hong Kong ETFs um, as well, but f primarily focused on trying to put up lots of interesting charts and analytics on those uh, Bitcoin ETFs. And then, as you said, uh, uh, sort of, as we noticed, like a real genuine excitement interest about these kind of Bitcoin ETFs, we realized, um, you know, people were craving even more kind of content uh, for that. And so we do, we've developed this uh, flow state at uh, a daily email focused on the Bitcoin flows into these uh, Bitcoin ETFs, but also um, really focusing as well on kind of bringing to light all of the kind of news that that's happening around it, because there's constantly new develops in terms of um, like different companies investing in it or who's investing in it or what, like we, we develop like a whale watch report so we can see all the 13 F filings and who's buying and when are they buying and how much are they buying and, 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 and all of the different uh, regulatory news that's happening. We just had, uh, well, we, we had, we had uh, the, the big potential breakout um, with this kind of Saab 121, um, uh, a bill that 
almost went through, got passed by Congress and the Senate and then vetoed by, by the uh, Biden administration. Um, so we kind of track, we just want to track all the action, all the news, as well as, you know, build out and show um, all the flows. And people love love seeing all the charts and this sort of thing. So we really try and track that pretty closely. And it's, it's really uh, important because, you know, this is like, this is probably the biggest story. I would say it's the biggest story of, I mean, in my opinion, it's, it's the biggest story of like this decade, certainly in all of finance. Um, like this is it, right? It's Bitcoin. It's Bitcoin's adoption to the world. So like this is like what what more could we be focusing? I this is this is exactly what we want to be focusing on, right? Yeah, hundred percent. I actually, it's been crazy to think about Bitcoin just even since I got in, and it was something that I got in twenty seventeen, and it was just kind of like that's crazy. That's a scam. It's a hundred percent a scam. You're going to, you know, you're going to lose all your money and you'll learn your lesson to now seeing BlackRock, seeing the biggest financial institutions, definitely stateside. And honestly, around the world, as we're talking about all these, every, every day I read a new country's dropping a Bitcoin ETF, right? So people around the world are trying to get essentially synthetic access to Bitcoin. And it's just kind of crazy to think about where we are. We're now at about a trillion, four, trillion, three, I haven't looked, whatever 69,000 is times 19.6 million, whatever that is. And it's like, okay, so the, you know, we're at a trillion. There was probably a time, and I wasn't there, where Bitcoiners were looking at and they were like, man, one day we're going to be worth a billion. And before that, it was 100 million. Before that, somebody, you know, it was $10 million in market cap and so on and so forth. So all you got to do is start adding zeros. And I, I kind of feel like plan B here, but it's like, we're at, you know, 1.4 trillion. And this is what somebody was asking me the other day. They were asking for my price prediction. And I said, let me give you the price prediction. I'm going to give it to you in market cap. I think we end up between somewhere between seven to nine trillion. And I was like, go do the math. But that's where I think we're going to roughly settle on this particular bull run. Do you think about it in similar terms as far as like a market cap as an overall inertia of adoption going money going from other assets and their premiums into Bitcoin? Or are you just like laser focused on a US dollar number? Or is there another metric? Like you're saying, it's like, it doesn't even matter at the point where, you know, Saudi Arabia is like, yep, this is what we're doing. We're taking oil and we're turning it into Bitcoin. Like which, is there a metric for you that maybe isn't just price or is it just price? Yeah, well, look, I think when you're trying to get I mean, I, I think what, what you're talking about is kind of the local top for like poten potentially kind of predicting a local top for Bitcoin in the next couple of years or whatever. Um, yeah. The way I would frame it is that right now there's about $900 trillion worth of financial assets in the world and it's growing um, pretty rapidly. But like, like this is, you know, just take Bitcoin out of the picture for a sec. We've got $900 trillion of assets and... The because of the fiscal um, situation in United States, but not just United States, really, um, just governments across the world, certainly China as well, um, and, and basically every every government all all across the world are in a situation of just a, enormous amounts of debt, like like we like we haven't seen in our lifetime. Like, we've never seen this level of debt. And we know that the way out for them to kind of manage the debt stress load, and this isn't a, uh, you know, we don't need to, like, get, like, it's, it's, it's not a moral judgment, it's not an ethical judgment, it's just, just maths, right? They're going to debase the currency to handle that debt load because they don't have a choice, they don't have any other option. So basically, they're going to expand the monetary base. And what that means is that the existing $900 trillion of assets, when measured in dollars, is going to grow a lot. So I would say that by 2030, conservatively, I would say you're going to be looking at $2,000 trillion. So we've got, I think that'll double in, in five five years. It, it, like that's, that's, a, that's a conservative, in my opinion. And so in a world in which you've got 2,000 trillion in assets, just that's all, that's everything. Then you have to think about what, what's Bitcoin's place in the world of, of assets. Uh, right now, well, as you said, it's just a little speck. It's, it's, it's 1.4 out of 900. 
I happen to think that um, Bitcoin has all the monetary properties that makes it so uh, it makes it so unique in the sense of it's it has it's been synthetically designed to be the perfect store of value. Like it, it it's literally created to be perfect. That was the purpose of it, actually. Like that's you know it ha it has if you if you were to go through and run through the process of make of designing the perfect monetary property. So it's literally you cannot improve it. It's perfect. That's how you. That's when you land on the Bitcoin store of value properties. And so it's because of that. It's this deflationary money designed to increase. Uh, it, it's still in a competition for assets, but it has these sort of better monetary properties that, unlike say, uh, its competition, like say gold, which you know people mining new gold every year, or they you know you could store your money in oil, but they're digging up more oil every year. So they, 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 there's all these different things that are, they're kind of, you could store your value and your energy in a lot of different ways. You could buy, you could buy homes, but they're building more homes every year. Um, they're building more art too, like they're creating more art. So there's all this kind of um, dilutionary, inflationary property you could invest your uh, savings and energy in, but then you've got Bitcoin, which just 21 million and it's not changing and it's just it's this hard fixed amount and so it has this kind of like perfectly engineered to be the best store of value um and because of that we're seeing like more and more more and more people are realizing that it's kind of a mind virus with the, the bitcoin adoption only goes up and i'm not talking about forget the price for a second the amount of people that understand Bitcoin and are excited about Bitcoin and want to invest in Bitcoin, there's more people like that today than there was a year ago. And, and, and it's just going up every year, constantly. It's never going down because it's like, it's a truth that's being unlocked across all of the world. And you have these different little pivot points along the way where capital might want to invest in it, but it doesn't know how or it can't invest in it or it's facing friction. I want to invest in it, but how do I do it? How do I custody it? These things, these things, these cha these challenges maybe hold it back. And then something comes along like the ETFs that make it accessible. Oh, now I can invest in it, but maybe my platform isn't offering it for me yet. Or maybe I want to see it have six months of trading data just so I can feel comfortable with BlackRock ETF or all of these different things are just like these little unlocks along the way. But the point that I would say is, is that you have a, the whole setup, the whole framing is that in five years, we're going to have $2,000 trillion of assets. And that's, that's my model roughly. And in that Bitcoin is going to take a growing share a growing share of the pie. I would expect, I would expect that we would see Bitcoin certainly challenge gold and actually really surpass gold because Bitcoin is a superior asset to gold in terms of store of value, in terms of um, branding, like there's a reason why we're talking about Bitcoin when I'm talking about gold. Nobody's talking like, like there's not, there's not, you know, there's not that kind of energy or interest in gold. It's not, it doesn't have the store. It doesn't have the monetary properties that, that Bitcoin has. And it doesn't have the brand and marketing that every person, every person under 40 is much more interested in, in Bitcoin than gold. And even, even you know, boomers don't really care about gold. It's just an old, it's an old, you know, there's a lot of reasons why Bitcoin is much better than gold. And so if you look at where gold is right now, gold is eh, 14 trillion out of, 14 trillion out of 900. Um, if we get, if we look at the whole space at having say 2000 trillion, I think Bitcoin at least surpasses Gold share, so 14 out of 900, that might be 30 out of 2,000, but I think Bitcoin surpasses that. I think Bitcoin might be, my, my approximation would be somewhere in the 50 to 100, 
a hundred trillion dollar asset by the end of the decade. So what what is that? You're looking at fifty x over over the over the next over the rest of the decade. That's 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 approximately what I um what I think. But you know this this could go a little bit faster. Could be go a little bit slower. Um, it's 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 always like difficult to predict because you know along the way we do actually like real things real political things come up that increase the speed or slow it down like grayscale sued and was able to unlock these etfs and that actually has you know by but when the sec enabled this, these etfs to come out it increased the speed of dip of bitcoin adoption there's another there's another timeline in which in which the ETFs don't get approved. Either way, Bitcoin is happening regardless, right? Like if they be- if they didn't do the ETFs, Bitcoin is still happening regardless, but it happens slower. You know, so there's going to be a whole series of battles along the way that's going to determine like just how quickly this happens. But I would say the outcome is uh, in- inevitable because you just... You, you, this is the like. That's what it means to have a deflationary asset. The, the, the deflationary asset, of which we're, of which we've never seen before, but we have one now, and that means it's going up forever. Like that's that's what it is. It's definitionally designed for that. So that that's my worldview. Yeah, I like the two thousand trillion, and then if it is two thousand trillion, and Bitcoin even gets to a hundred trillion, which if you're listening, you're like, oh, that's crazy. In that scenario where it's 2000 trillion by the end of the decade, we'll say 2030, it's a round number and Bitcoin's only at a hundred trillion. It's still one half of 1%. <laughs> it's still fairly, you know, it hasn't eaten up maybe as much as it could, or it will continue to between 2030 and 2040 in that model. And if I could, how, how do you get to 2000 trillion? Is that just well, I- looking at we're going to print money? <laughs> Yeah, well, it, it is a little. I mean, if it was a hundred trillion, it's a little bit more than a half of one. Like, a, a, say, if it were to be a hundred trillion in, in, out of a two thousand trillion dollar base, you would be looking about that's about five percent of. Yeah, of, my math of, was bad there, huh? <laughs> no, that's all right. Yeah, but <laughs> I just carried the one. Yeah, there we go. But, but with that being said, it's not. That's like. Well, first of all, first of all, you talk to most most uh excited bitcoin investors and they're allocating much more than five percent of their portfolio to bitcoin five percent like right now five percent is the is the uh amount that's sort of like the pension funds that are coming on board right now when they like have you know they're just they're going to dip their toes in and they're going to that's when they put in the half a percent, one percent. But when you have everybody investing their money in Bitcoin, the, the you would naturally expect you would naturally expect that number to grow, particularly over time, because what, what will happen is the volatility volatility will dampen over time. So become a bit less um a bit less risky in terms of the downside, which in just enable like that's one of the things that kind of uh, keeps keeps it at a relative like people portfolio allocation that can be a bit nervous to allocate to it because you know we see these kind of drawdowns in Bitcoin and so as the volatility dampens over time, people are more comfortable going, oh yeah, I ex- I don't expect it to go up five hundred percent a year. I expect it to go up forty percent. And I'm happy to put in five, ten percent of my wealth into that, just like you would, just like you would investing in like an Apple stock or something like that. Um, so anyway, sorry. What, what was the what was the other sort of question following that conversation? No, yeah. First of all, it was my horrible math, and now I'm never going to live that down because it's on the pod. Um, but it was just like if we look at it being five percent. I think it's like okay, if it is five percent, right? It's a hundred trillion of two uh, two thousand trillion. Is that a lot? I didn't really even ask a question. You you just kind of went into kind of asking the question, is that a lot or is it not relatively? And then we kind of looked at portfolio, uh, you know, portfolio building, which is like, yeah, as you're saying, most people who are buying Bitcoin, straight Bitcoin, not talking about Bitcoin ETFs, 
are definitely putting in more than 5%. So it's kind of like, you know, um, well, the, the other thing that I would, I would just say is that we're, we're transitioning, right? Where mm-hmm. right now you have this world in which most people that have serious assets, they have 80% of their wealth, 90% of their wealth, a hundred percent of their wealth in their house. Like, like you want to talk about financial risk, that's, that's, you know, it's, 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 it's the most common thing to do is actually they have more than a hundred percent of their wealth. Realistically, they let, leave it up. Realistically, they, what, what you're told today, you know, I, I, like I live in Australia, it's different, it's different where, where, where you are all over the world, but you know, people are encouraged to scrounge together Two hundred thousand dollars and put that on a down payment and, f- f- and lever it up five five to one to buy a million dollar house. So they've they've kind of have five hundred percent of their assets in one in one investment vehicle. So it, when you when you start to compare the risk framework of a five percent like a five percent allocation to Bitcoin doesn't seem all that outrageous when you when you actually think about the world we live in today in which it's just common practice, you know, or oh, you're a young, responsible, like, well-adjusted human being, you're going to put in 500% of your assets into this one vehicle. Like, that's what, that's the sort of, um, you know, we'll throw a party for you if you do that normally today, right? Oh, you bought a house, you know, you, you congratulations. But th- this is this is a much uh, less aggressive um framework in terms of how people can responsibly save and invest. And I think that's uh, where the future is going, partly because um, Bitcoin is just like a better vehicle to save your money relative to your home. Um, and and partly like because, you know, young people are just are not, it's, it, it, it starts to be less attractive like the, the math doesn't work for people when you say to them, you know, it's going to cost you two, $2 million to buy a house. It's like, I'm going to do something different. Like I'll just do something different. So, and I think that uh, that's part of the story as well. So, cause it's, it's housing, which is take like, that's sort of the dominant uh, portion of financial assets right there. That and government bonds are the two, the two big ones. And I think Bitcoin eats into both those those things it's interesting you bring up the housing because in society at least in the northeast of the united states and probably honestly in most united states if you are in a room and thanksgiving you're at a party okay and everyone's sitting there drinking talking whatever sharing stuff and you share you could share one of two things you could say hey i'm into bitcoin or you could say hey i own a house if you say, Hey, I own a house, you're going to get cheers. Everyone's going to kind of look at you in the room. And I feel like at this point, and I'm going to make this statement. I don't know how many of my friends listen to this who are homeowners, but I feel like at this point, they're all just like, yeah, we're in this like sinking ship. So if you're not in it, we're going to make you feel bad because we want you to be in it. Um, because so many of my friends as homeowners spend all their weekends, which is their time, just dumping it into a single family home. And then they are not realizing that they're not actually building wealth over the long term, even though that's the story they're telling themselves. Cause honestly, that's what their parents did. And that's what their grandparents did in the U S context. I'm sure it's very similar in many other places in the world, but it's like, or, or as if you were to say, Oh yeah, I'm, I'm investing in Bitcoin and I'm renting man. And I know this for a fact. I mean, you, I'm just a leper. I'm just a leper. Um, and it's crazy because I think if, if your goal is to build wealth and your goal is to save value for the future, I can't think of a worse thing right now than a single family home, especially right now where rates are so ridiculous. Um, and many of my friends just do where I have friends, they're on the coast. They're with, they can see the ocean. I'm just like, that is counterparty risk (laughs) climate. You know, the, the oceans rising is the biggest counterparty risk I could possibly see towards your, towards your, uh, towards your situation. But uh, it is interesting that you brought that up because the more I dive into Bitcoin and the more I listen to Bitcoiners talking, the more I spend time around Bitcoiners, a lot of Bitcoiners are just renting. They're like, you know, I'm not, I don't have to do maintenance. I don't have to figure out taxes. I don't have to do any of this. 
I don't know if you want to share whether you're renting or you're, or you're a homeowner or, or if Bitcoin influenced that, but it's an interesting conversation that I think a lot of people between 25 and 45 are constantly having who are into Bitcoin and who are kind of looking at what's, what's going to happen. Yeah, I, I am a, like, I, I rent as well uh, for, that, for, that, for that reason. I, I wouldn't say it's the worst thing you can do with your, your money to buy, buy a home. <laughs> okay, I mean, that, was, certain... that was hyperbolic. That was hyperbolic. But, but in between those two options, that's what I would say, yeah. Uh, I, I just, I would say, yeah. I mean, my, my framing would be like, if this was 30 years ago, it's probably the best thing you could do. If in, in, in the, it's, as a 20th century idea, um, you know, how do you protect yourself against, as we, as we talked about, you know, a few mo- moments ago, you have this... Uh, like just waves of money being created by the kind of well the the, the system we we exist in, we exist in which is you know the the money supply is going to grow conservatively at ten percent a year but probably a lot more um, and and so in that world like in that world if you can create like an, like a really f- uh, valuable asset is I'm going to borrow it borrow a lot of money at four percent interest or and then have the, the inflation rate really be you know 10 15 percent and my house just my house just a house that doesn't really move but the the mortgage gets washed away basically by the inflation and you, you end up like it's a really that 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 was a really strong idea in the 20th century and certainly uh all the people that bought houses 30 years ago did you know not everybody but pretty much everybody did pretty well off that idea uh, the problem is, is that it's not, it's like just an inferior idea today um, because, you know, you still, you, you big, in, in a world in which you've, you're comparing with Bitcoin, it's like, I mean, what's, what's Bitcoin up this year? It's up 60% this year. What was it up? 150% last year. Like, it, it, just go back and look at its five year, 10 year history. Like, we know if you if you want to price a house in bitcoin it's going down that's that that's fundamentally the problem so and i think that a lot of people um the challenge the sort of the flip side or the kind of counterbalance to what i'm saying is like yeah but i want to live in a house and it's like it's for sure true like you you need to live somewhere um but that's that's like as a utility it's not just not a financial like that's there's kind of a different elements to it like there's utility from living in a home which you have to live somewhere and you want it to be nice and that's really important for your life you only have one life and like don't don't live somewhere you don't like like that's a bad idea you know find something great but um buying a home because you have to understand like why you're doing it it's the problem is it's that it's the biggest financial investment people make by far by orders of magnitude and they're not do they're not even doing they're not even optimizing for financial re like that's that's when you make a mistake when you're not even like optimizing it based on your finances you're just doing it because there's sort of some emotional pull to owning a home when reality is um if you if you actually are like trying to think about it from a wealth building strategy it's just not the best strategy to for 2024 and in, in the future. We we just live in a, a different world than the world our parents lived in. So um, so yeah yeah. For that reason, I uh, I rent and I I I, I can't imagine. Um, you know, I mean, look, if 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 once we want maybe maybe in 2030 and Bitcoin is kind of a fifty hundred trillion dollar market cap at that point it might be time it might be time to kind of rebalance and buy a home uh, but but uh but i think for right now now i'm happy to rent. yeah i, I hear 100 percent. and actually i kind of want to go back and i've been interested to ask you specifically about this when we first started to talk you were talking about how the institutional investors are coming in and and they're looking to hold and they have maybe just a longer term you know a longer a long a different time horizon then maybe the retail trader who hops in, sees it goes down 10%, gets scared, gets out, and then it goes back up 30%. And then they're like, oh, damn it. You know, um, sure. one of the things that I've recently been kind of challenged by, and, and it was good, it was good, it's good to be challenged. If Bitcoin's not challenging you, you're not doing it properly, right? 
there was a guy who has been around Bitcoin since 2009, 2010, got in super early, found some wealth there. That was good. He, he's still working in Bitcoin. And he was like, hey, I hear you want to hodl. I understand that. You got in much later than me. Things are different, at least if we're just looking at the economics. But he said, I encourage you to try to spend sats where you can spend sats. Because if no one spends sats, the network just, it isn't as good, right? If, if you're not like actually using it to buy stuff and, and, and gaining utility, like you're saying, Hey, maybe at a certain price, me too, uh, we'll be changing sats for a home, right? For real estate. How are you thinking about your hodl versus maybe the sats that you use to do stuff? Like if you were visiting me, uh, in Colombia with your partner and we go out to dinner and you're like, Hey, I'm going to take you to dinner. And they actually, you know, accept sats. Are you selling them now? Is this like a, I want to time the market type thing, or is there a certain amount that you're like, you know what? I'm always going to feel fine with using one to 2% of my sats for, you know, it, basically a commerce. Yeah. Look, I don't think it makes sense to do anything other than what's in your own interest. And what I mean by that is like, you know, there are certain situations in which it makes sense to you know, spend Bitcoin. If, if you find yourself in a situation, particularly like an internet transaction in which it's just more convenient to use Bitcoin than it would be, uh, like if Jared, if I was going to send you money, uh, cause we're in a different country, I would send you Bitcoin cause how, how, how the hell am I going to send money to Colombia? Like that's <laughs> so in that, in that situation, very happy, you know, that, that makes perfect sense. Uh, and, and we, you know, have like w with Apollo, right? We have, uh, part of what we, what we do is we have a kind of a review marketplace where we, uh, incentivize people to provide, uh, reviews of different products and services. And we pay them in, in Bitcoin to do that because there's people all over the world and we want to be able to send sort of, uh, global instantaneous payments and it's just much easier like there's no there's no other way to do it other than sort of using lightning bitcoin uh with that said i don't think there's any point in um doing it just for like i'm not i'm not a big believer that uh, i'm not a big believer in doing it because it's the quote-unquote right thing to do i don't think i think that the incentive model if the incentive model isn't there it doesn't matter in the sense of um, you know, if, 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 if it's better, if it's better and more useful to send Bitcoin, send Bitcoin. If it's not like I, when I, when I, when I go buy a coffee down the street, I'm happy to, I'm happy to tap with my, with my debit card. But the UX actually works pretty well. Like it's, it's, a, it's, 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 it's not, um, it's, it's not a big issue for me to pay, pay for my coffees with Bitcoin. Um. And I'm not, I'm not concerned about that. And I don't think it matters for, uh, Bitcoin adoption, whether we are, whether people are paying for their groceries in, in, in Bitcoin. I don't, I don't, I just don't think it, it matters at all. Um, so I, I like from my perspective, you know, spend Bitcoin when it makes sense, but, uh, Bitcoin is primarily like. The, the spending properties of Bitcoin are like really nice to be able to, uh, like global instant payments. That's like certainly via lightning, but just, you know, internet, internet money, the medium of, of exchange element, that's like cool. It's, it's like, it's, it's really useful, but the reason why Bitcoin is, um, so important is because of the store of value properties elements of it. Like the reason why everybody's going to do it is because it's like, this is how you build wealth. And that's what, that's what the kill, the killer app of Bitcoin is you hold it and it's worth more in the future. Like that's, that's what makes it so useful to everybody in the planet. Uh, and I don't think that, it's really dependent upon whether we use it to buy our groceries or buy our pay for coffee with it. Um, so I just not, I'm not like overly concerned about that. I mean, I think that it's great 
when when these kind of specific use cases come up, like I said, with uh, incentivizing people for reviews on our server on our on our website, that's a perfect use case. Great, let's use some Bitcoin for that because it's just much more convenient to do that than anything else. But um, you know, I I I don't like concern myself with oh, we need to kind of stim stimulate a circular economy and that's that's how Bitcoin that's how Bitcoin adoption happens. Like, no, Bitcoin adoption happens when when you have um, all the financial advisors in America managing $8 trillion of assets and they all put 3% of their clients' portfolios in it and you get $200 billion of flow. So that's Bitcoin adoption. Like, that's, that's how Bitcoin price rises. That's how people get invested in Bitcoin. That's Bitcoin adoption. And Bitcoin adoption is not going to happen because, you know, we 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 all start like you know I I freaking I I I I like design something nice for you and send it to you and you pay me in Bitcoin like it's it's not it's not uh, that's not what that's not how this works so that's that's my view yeah I I hear you I talking about and, and now you're talking about inflows like if we're talking about the ETFs. Is there a, is there a, and I don't know if this exists, right? But is there a moment where you're like institutions own too much Bitcoin? Because I think now they own 4% of all Bitcoin ever. Is that right? Is it four or five? I think it's a pretty round number. Uh, well, depend. I mean, it depends who, who you're counting. I mean, the U S ETFs own about 860,000 Bitcoin. And then they're actually, um, more there's actually more bitcoin when you start looking at all the other uh etfs all across the world mm -hmm. it starts to get over a million in bitcoin which i guess i guess you're, you're sort of hitting up on about five percent then you can look at micro strategy there's another couple hundred thousand bitcoin uh that's basically that's one percent uh but to, the answer to your question is no i don't i i I'm just not concerned um i'm not concerned about that at all um as long as the reason why is because it doesn't influence our ability to transact on the network. Like if Bitcoin was a proof of stake network, which it's not, but if it was, then that would, that would really be important because the people that own the coins, that control the coins, they stake the coins, they have control of uh, your ability to transact on the network. But that's not the world we live in with Bitcoin. It doesn't, it, it is like it doesn't matter how many coins MicroStrategy acquires. They can't they can't stop your ability to own it. They can't stop your ability to trade it, and they can't manipulate the network in terms of the amount of coins. And they have no extra power within the network. So it doesn't. You know, it's like it's good for them for sure. The more Bitcoin they own, like that's that's great for them. Uh, and it, and there might be kind of um, consequences like outside of Bitcoin, like you might have people just like the real world today where there are, there are people that uh, might, might have a lot of money and then they can use that kind of power and influence to do things in the world and you might not like what they do with it. I mean, that's a like that's a real thing, right? We all every, everybody has a, you know, oh, there's a billionaire that he's promoting or they're promoting this particular idea and you don't like that. Everybody can like, like, but that's, that's got nothing to do with Bitcoin. That's just money and power. And sometimes people you don't like have money and power, but in terms of the Bitcoin network, it doesn't, it doesn't make any difference how much they own. It just doesn't affect, um, anything that I want to do within Bitcoin. So not at all. And in fact, in fact, the more they buy, uh, the more that, uh, Bitcoin uh, gets kind of embedded into the system and it grows and it, and it, and it flourishes and it becomes, um, it, 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 it gets closer to its sort of end journey, which is being the kind of global reserve currency of the world, which I think is where, where this is all going, but it's just, you know, not, um, like that, that will, that, I think that'll be something we'll see in our lifetime, but it might not be this thing that we see in the next five years. I was actually just going to say, do you think we'll see it in our lifetime? I feel like you and I are roughly around the same age. And so 
I assume we'll see something close to that, or it will be kind of like the hybrid theory that Lynn Alden has talked about where you'll have Bitcoin and then you'll have a stable coin or some other digital dollar or whatever it is that you just kind of use for smaller daily transactions. And then Bitcoin is something that's bigger for other transactions, especially if the fees in the network become kind of prohibitive to use it for small transactions, obviously outside of lightning. So, yeah. Um, look, I think, I think that right now that's kind of, um, it could go either way in terms of Bitcoin may end up being this kind of, it's a store of value, like just in the same way, you know, houses, we don't, we don't, we don't like, our, the primary saving account for most most human beings is their home, but they don't use that to trade their home for their groceries. I think there's a world in which Bitcoin is like that. You know, it's the savings account of the world, just like how, or how people, you know, take most of their wealth and they put it in the S&P 500. But then they also have, you know, this like the bank account, checking account to make their small payments. And I think that's a very realistic outcome. Um, equally, uh, I wouldn't at all be shocked if in time we see a situation in which people are just like, yeah, just pay me in sats, like uh, just, just pay me in sats. And I think that, um, the reason why that's so hard to fundamentally predict is because it's not the, the, the issue is going to be that, um, it's probably going to depend on where you are in your geography in the world. Like it's a fundamentally political problem, which is the governments get to decide what their local currency is. And that's always going to be true. The government doesn't get to decide the value of their currency. That's a market decision. Like the, the you know, and, and, and that, and that there are consequences from inflation and these kinds of things, but the government can say, if you want to live here, you're going to use this currency, this is the only legal tender and you're going to pay your taxes in this currency. And if you don't do that, we're going to put you in jail. Like that's like they, the government can do that. And as long as that's true, then there's no guarantee that we end up in a situation in which people are using sats as a kind of, uh, quote unquote, like the, the currency money type idea. A bit big, but Bitcoin can always be that kind of store of value um, in, in sort of in the same way that it is today, but just, just for everybody, basically. So that'll be really you... interesting to see how that plays out. Um, but, you know, I kind of think that like, we're going to see a bit of everything in the kind of passage of time in the sense of like, I think that Bitcoin is like the final, um, I, you know, there's a, there was a book 30 years ago written by Fukuyama called the, the end of history. Um, well, I think that that's what, like, that's what you could write that same book, but about money in terms of like the end of the history of money in terms of with Bitcoin, like Bitcoin is the final evolution of it, that everything has been building towards Bitcoin. And so Bitcoin will be around for as long as humans are around, I think. And then it's probably going to go through different periods of it's used as the base or, you know, people try a different currency, but peg to it. And then there's going to be probably 500,000 iterations over the next 500,000 years. You know what I mean? Like it's just going to be around forever from here. So we'll see everything. Yeah, unfortunately, you and I won't be around unless there are some crazy medical advances to 2140 because I am very fascinated as I work with the mining industry to see how a world would exist where there's no block reward and there's only fees because that would be just crazy. Uh, it'd be kind of crazy to see, uh, especially even after, after or it's like over the last 24 hours from when we re uh, we've recorded this episode or the last 48 hours, I should say, the hash rate has gone up 50% and it's all driven by fees. Um, so it is interesting to see the demand for the network and how that could potentially grow. I, I wanted to ask you of the, of the United States, Canada, Europe, Australia, I don't want to say Western nations cause it's not always Western in, in its geography, but what is going to be one of the more powerful economic nations to say, well, let's make this tender uh, a la El Salvador. Wh which one do you think 
And I also wonder if there's a nation that can do it in Europe that's part of the EU, if they can like unilaterally do that and leave the euro. I mean, I guess they can. Brexit, I mean, left for trade reasons and stuff. So is there, you know, because we could obviously, what's then speculate about what nation we think is going to start, you know, buying Bitcoin. But is there a nation you think that's going to see the value in having, letting its citizens basically be able to transact this without having a uh, a tax implication? And, and which one do you think that that's going to be? Yeah, look, I don't, I don't predict it in any time soon, but I think that, I think actually, actually, I think that's quite an easy uh, answer to the, the question. And, and the, the, the reason why is it's like, which is the, which is the country synonymous with freedom? Uh, I, I think it's, I think it's the United States. I think that's, that's the, that's a, like, I just think that's the, um, the country that is, is built into its DNA. You, you, the U S the U S, um, well, first of all, you've already got a presidential candidate in Trump who's coming out and saying he's a crypto president. And then you, Robert F. Kennedy is trying to become uh, a president and he's saying he will back the dollar with Bitcoin. He's not going to win, but, you know, he, he's, he's legitimately the third, probably the third most likely person to be president, although still nonetheless unlikely. Um, but my, my point is, is that I don't think there's any question the answer is America. Um, and you know, it's not even like that. It's not even that. I, I don't think you, you you're never going to, cause it's not going to happen by force. It's not going to be like El Salvador. <laughs> El Salvador kind of pushed it. I don't think you'll see that. I think it would be a situation in which you, you might have a situation and say, yeah, you can transact in whatever, current, whatever, whatever you want to use. And then that's just a freedom thing. And it's very easy to imagine that happening uh, and, and it kind of growing from that. But with that being said, I don't think that that's like, it's not, that's not the part of the Bitcoin uh, story. That's not, it's not like the arc that we're in at the moment. It's not, um, I don't, I think it's a mis, like, it's not to say that Bitcoin won't end up being like kind of money or whatever, but it's just, um, it's not like, Bitcoin's story right now is kind of Bitcoin isn't competing with the dollar. It's competing with like Vanguard index funds like that. You know, the, like the, there's the, it's, it's competing with the S and P 500. It's competing with real estate. It's competing with gold. Like that's what it's actually competing with in terms of allocating institutional capital to a portfolio to hold Bitcoin. Not, not because I want to use it as not because I want to spend it, but because I want to, it's just like, I want to have a diversified asset within my portfolio that's got a high expected return. It's going to have offer alpha. It's going to offer, you know, uncorrelated returns relative to the stock market. Like that's what, that's what's attracting people to Bitcoin right now. That's why you're seeing these kind of institutional money flowing in. Uh, and that's kind of the, where we are in the arc of Bitcoin. I think in five, 10, 20 years. Yeah, we might, we might see this kind of, currency story play out maybe who knows it's very hard to predict the future but like right now it's it's very much um bitcoin is is, is like property i want to hold in my portfolio because of the uh characteristics it does it, and like just the way it enhances the financial portfolio i think that's that's the best way to look at it right now yeah i'm glad you brought up the candidates because it has been interesting to see Biden and the Democrats basically hop on the crypto slash Bitcoin train, even in the last 10 days, basically because it's a game theory situation where Trump's doing it. And, and people, you know, the Biden campaign's like, oof, that looks pretty good. Why don't we get a, why don't we get a little piece of that, a little taste of that? And I do think, like you said, RFK has no chance. Fortunately, it's just not going to work out for him. He's no chance. But I do think this is the last election where crypto and Bitcoin are aren't something that's a, maybe even its own voter block of people that are like single issue voters. Um, I don't know if that happens in the rest of the world, but in America, there's a couple hot topics where if you touch any of them, you know, that just really pushes you to where you're going to vote. And I do think in this election, obviously for Bitcoiners uh, that can vote in the US, 100%, it, it's becoming a bigger thing. But definitely for the next election, it will totally be up there with like gun laws, laws around abortion, and then Bitcoin. Because one of the bills that's actually up is the Damel, and this is being pushed by Elizabeth Warren, which is the 
Oh, I should know this. Uh, the digital asset money laundering bill. And obviously the bill sounds really uh, not hostile, but what it basically is saying is that if you are a U.S. citizen and you hold keys essentially to your own wallet, then you have to register yourself essentially as a financial institution, which is a nice way of her saying it's over. Um, it's getting difficult, right? Right. So it's, it, I'd love that you said that as someone, uh, you know, who's not stateside looking at it from 30,000 feet that you think the U.S. is the country that's built on freedom. Therefore, Bitcoin aligns with that. Do you also then think that the U.S. is one of the bigger nations economically that's going to start buying Bitcoin, turning its money printing into uh, sats? I think that it happens. I, I think that you get the um, indirectly in the, in the short run, and, and which is wh what I mean is that when the Fed, when the Fed, uh, the Fed lowest rates, there's quantitative easing, which I think all that, all of that stuff will happen again in the, in the 20s for sure. Um, this is, this monetary printing, it, it's increasing the value of assets. And even if the government itself isn't buying Bitcoin, if the government is creating new money and it flows into assets and those assets then flow into Bitcoin, you end up getting, like it's happen it happens regardless sort of it, it's a hundred percent happening that the the government is essentially doing that having that effect it just might not be happening directly i don't know uh, i don't expect kind of look i i, I mean I'm, it's shocking to see even rfk coming and saying he would back bitcoin with the sorry back the dollar with bitcoin it kind of tells you that maybe it's not as far away as i may have thought but i don't uh i would be surprised to see government kind of adopted as like a treasury reserve asset. But I, I think they'll let the private sector do that. And it's first for a private sector asset. Or if you want to call these kind of quasi government institutions, like these pension funds, they're not, you know, it's not government, but it's kind of uh, government adjacent, like Wisconsin pension fund. I mean, it's, you know, it's a sort of local government, government adjacent, and they're buying Bitcoin. So you, you, you know what I am you, you sort of know, get see what I'm getting at there. That's going to happen big time, and that already is happening. Uh, so I think that that's that's where we see the adoption. Yeah, I I agree with you, and I hadn't put it ever so succinctly even in my head. So thank you for that. But it's kind of like when you look at the landscape right now, Coinbase says something like, I forget the exact digits. Forty five million people are in crypto in the states which is, you know, a little, it's a little bit more than 10%. Anyways, it's a good chunk of people. And it's still the wealthiest country on the planet. I'm not sure if China's passed on a per, on a per capita we are, but I think on a overall GDP, China was bigger for a second there. But the point is you have this nation that, like you're saying, whether it's the Wisconsin Pension Fund or the thing I'm very interested in, and I talk about this a good amount, is that now there's all these different routes as exactly what you're saying that are tangentially tied to Bitcoin's price. Whether you're buying Coinbase stock, you're buying MicroStrategy stock, you're buying any of the 30 publicly traded Bitcoin miners, which have ridiculous days if you watch those. Sometimes they're up 50% in one day. I don't know how sustainable that is. Uh, or you have the ETFs. You have now just from a TradFi portfolio, access 50 different things you could put into, and you're essentially getting synthetic exposure to Bitcoin's price movement, which I think is fascinating. And if enough people have 401ks in the States or whatever their financial vehicles are, I think long-term this really helps the United States uh, to almost maybe slow the decline of the middle class, um, which I think is actually, you know, tied to other things that we've kind of talked about, which is uh, single family homes and Gen Z and millennials putting in, like you said, 500% of their net worth into uh, into an asset that maybe is not going to be building at the levels it was for their grandparents or parents. Yeah. I mean, fundamentally, it's an enormous uh, opportunity and like wealth transfer that's taking place essentially um, out of the, 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 the big losers are the people holding government bonds because they're inflating away. They're just not holding their purchasing power. And the big win is the people that are that own Bitcoin. And it's an enormous opportunity for... Uh, certainly, you're going to see the existing, existing rich people, they're not going to want to uh, lose 
lose their wealth, and so they're going to buy Bitcoin. Mm-hmm. And then, yeah, there's an opportunity for a kind of uh, new group of new, new group of investors that are that are kind of switched on and and seek the opportunity, and they take advantage of it, and they buy buy, buy Bitcoin. And ultimately, like. The numbers, the numbers are the numbers. Like it's not, you know, it's just this. This is just happening. Like it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. Like what what you think about it or I think about it or anything. Like it's just like this is the maths. These are the numbers. These are the returns. We talked about this. We talked about this a year ago, and then since we last talked, Bitcoin is up two hundred percent or something. Like this is just like um, we'll probably chat in June next year, and we'll it'll be the same. Uh, it'll be the same thing. Like that's just you know, and that that's just that's that's just the game. That's just the the reality of this economic situation, and you can kind of like the 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 challenge that I think a lot of people have right now is that um, they don't they're not they they think it doesn't affect them in the sense of they haven't quite caught on to the fact that like Bitcoin is their opportunity cost in the sense that. Um, it's it's easy to ignore something that is let me put it like this i don't worry i i'm not invested in gamestop and gamestop is like fluctuating and you know and and like it gamestop could might might go up like 10x tomorrow i don't know like and it's like it's fine and cool and exciting and i, I hope for the investors it does i don't really like it doesn't bother me. I don't really care one way or the other, right? It's just not um, like it's not an investable asset for me. I'm not going to own it. I don't care. It's a, the point is, is that it just doesn't affect me one way. Or, it just doesn't affect my future one way or the other. Whereas Bitcoin is very different because if you don't own it, like you just you just eventually you have a situation with. Oh, you're just like now you're poorer because you didn't own Bitcoin. Like you, you actually like you just like sorry, but you know you invested in the wrong thing and you lose. Like that sucks, but that's that's the game we that that's the game we're in. And so you know you you people people kind of the sooner people realize like uh, n- none of us have. I, I mean, it sounds like a bit crass to say, but I, I don't think like I don't feel like I have a choice in the matter. Like that's just it is what it is. You know, the, this is playing out, and if you don't invest in it, then you're in a situation in which okay, well, you cannot. But the the like if I if you just you can put your money in government bonds and just leave it in that, and but you lose all you like they you know your wealth dissipates. It's just gone, and like. If you don't want to do that, what else are you going to, you have to, you have to find the alternative. So, um, I think more people are kind of realizing that. And that's why you get this situation of these unlocks where these people that were previously unfriendly to Bitcoin, like, why did they change their mind? It's because they, they, they had no other choice, but to change their mind. Like Larry Fink calls Bitcoin an index of money laundering. And then... A few years later, and he calls it. It's a flight to safety. It's a, it's a flight to quality. It's the it's it's the quality. It's the only investable. You know. Well, why did he change his mind? Because he didn't have a choice. Like, he didn't have a choice. None of us have a choice. So that's that's kind of my mental framing on it. Um, and I think I I just think that's how it's going to play out. Yeah, I love that. I I think it's a uh, it's a pretty binary option these days. You're either in the lifeboat or you're not. And uh, that's kind of how that goes. Can you talk a little bit about the flow, the flow state and what that looks like and how people can kind of get access to that? Because I see that I see you post about that a lot. And it's something I personally need to tap into as well, because obviously all the stuff that you share and how Paula shares is just gold. Oh, well, thanks. Look, I appreciate that. Yeah. So we have a, uh, a daily newsletter, which we, we, we send out, uh, which provides essentially breaks down all the like, charts, news, and analysis of all of the ETF flows, but really all of uh, what I would say is the adoption of Bitcoin into the traditional financial world. We're really focusing on ed- institutional adoption because we can follow those flows, and that's really what determines. That's what shows up in what's impacting the price. Uh, so we're really focused on 
essentially just following all the action because it's just it's it's exciting it's entertaining we want to follow the news we want to present it uh and we want to uh, make it accessible for people to understand what's happening so we 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 uh build up and focus on building a bank of all these amazing charts and everything which we just give, give away for free and d deliver it daily uh it's available at flows.heyapollo.com um you can sign up for sign up for the free newsletter and yeah, I I think um, you know we're, we're we're really like this is this is something that people have a kind of a we we get this like feedback a lot, which is just there's a huge kind of uh, excitement and interest in in this kind of um, it's 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 just this lens of Bitcoin adoption is how I would describe it. It's a, it's it's our lens, but I think it's. Probably the most interesting lens of Bitcoin adoption for 2024. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think the stuff you guys are putting out, and since January 10th or January 11th when they started trading, you guys have just been, you and Hey Apollo have just been crushing it. Um, I think it was even Lynn Alden on what Bitcoin did with Peter McCormick, or it's the other way around. Peter McCormick had mentioned this to Lynn Alden. They were talking about Hey Apollo's flows, or they were talking about Hey Apollo's charts, which I was like, wow. So, you know, the Bitcoin world is watching. You guys are creating some of the best content in Bitcoin. So it was, for me, a pleasure to, you know, have you on here and, and you know, for, for you to share some of your time. Um, do you want to take a quick moment and shout out uh, where people can find you? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, on, on X, um, at Thomas underscore Farah, and uh, yeah, otherwise, for the daily newsletter, you'll, you'll find a link on my Twitter profile, but also it's flows.hairpolar.com. Um, also, like, really happy for people to send me a DM. I mean, I love kind of just meeting, chatting with Bitcoiners. So anybody that hears this wants to reach out and have a chat, let me know. I will add all those links in the uh, show's description, as well as our original podcast, which was episode 80, which was by the time this is published, it's honestly almost a week, uh, a year to the date, which is crazy. So yes, please come on next June. Maybe we'll, this will be a thing. We just find each other every June and we just kind of look back and we're like, whoa. Um, if you're listening to this in a podcast platform, please go ahead and subscribe. If you're watching on YouTube. Please go ahead and subscribe. Find us at more than blockchain across social media platforms. And if you enjoyed this, please share it with someone else. I think Thomas's perspective on Bitcoin is clear, concise, and it's experience-based, which I really enjoy the most. So um, Thomas, thank you for hopping on, and I will invite you back on next June. Looking forward to it.